In this video we're going to use the n-dimensional fast Fourier transformation to take spectral derivatives of a 3D scalar field. Let's get started. The channel sponsor Pasteur Labs is currently hiring SciML and software engineering positions. Check out pasteurlabs.ai slash careers for more details. Hi and welcome to this new video where we're going to extend the idea of taking spectral derivatives to three dimensions. We are again working with real valued fields, so it is sufficient to use the RFFT and its higher dimensional counterpart is the RFFTN, allowing us to perform an FFT over an arbitrary number of axes. I already imported NumPy and also Plotly because visualization in 3D is a bit more easier or nicer with Plotly than with Matplotlib. Then let's start by defining the domain on which we operate. So again, I want to use a unit domain. So in three dimensions, that would be the unit cube. So it's something which has an extent of one in all of the three dimensions. And then I want to discretize each of the three dimensions with 40 points. These two constants allow us to define the mesh in 1D, which is numpy.linspace 0 to L n points, so linearly space n points from 0 to L, and we will again exclude the endpoint as per convention for the fast Fourier transformation, and of course also because our field is assumed to be periodic, and as such one of the boundary points is redundant and we choose the right point. Then we can use the mesh in one dimensions to mesh crit meshes in higher dimensions, so I just want to call the three-dimensional mesh just mesh and we will use numpy.stack on numpy.meshcrit on mesh1d, comma mesh1d, comma mesh1d. So we will take three meshes, uh, three 1d meshes, which are supposed to be the meshes in x direction, the meshes in y direction and the meshes in z direction and then create three axes arrays out of them, which represents the way these coordinates are in this three-dimensional mesh. And here I think it makes, for especially for higher dimensional meshes, it makes more sense to swap the indexing style from the default xy to the indexing ij, because with that indexing, the axis zero or the leftmost axis corresponds to x or x0 and then so on and so forth. So the way these axes are numbered corresponds to also how you would logically think of axes. But this in the opposite actually means that we have to be a bit more careful when plotting, but I find this more helpful or easier to work with. So mesh crit returns three, three axis arrays and then those are stacked together into one large four axis array which has three dimensions in the zero of axis. So let's execute that and then we shall see. So this is a 3, 40, 40, 40 array. And when we index mesh at zero, we essentially get all the X coordinates in our mesh. And if we access at one, then we get all the Y coordinates and so on and so forth. So this theoretically also works in arbitrarily high dimensions. Of course, these tensors or arrays will become quite large then. So that's the mesh. Let's go on and define the function we actually want to differentiate. And here I just have the function that is a collection of modes in x, y and z direction. So let's say f is lambda x with numpy dot sign of two times numpy dot pi times x of zero divided by l multiplied with numpy dot sign on four times numpy dot pi times x of one divided by l multiplied with numpy dot cosine of two times numpy dot pi times x two divided by l. So it is a scalar field. So the return of when you give it a coordinate vector, which has three entries, its result will be a scalar, uh, so a floating point value. and Functionally, it is a first sign mode in x direction, it's the second sign mode in y direction, and it's the first cosine mode in z direction. And now we are interested in its derivatives. Naturally, if we have three input dimensions, 
the derivative or the more general terminology for the derivative is the gradient, which has three partial derivatives, which we can also write down analytically. So we first have the derivative with respect to x0. So we say this is enough for a lambda function. So essentially, if we derive that function with respect to x0, we see that these two letter terms in the product do not affect. So they essentially are constants. And only that one is going to be derived. And then we get 2 times numpy dot pi divided by L multiplied with numpy dot cosine of 2 times numpy dot pi times x0 divided by L. And then essentially we keep the left and copy it down. And I will spare you the derivation of the other two partial derivatives and just copy them in here. Then we can discretize all the four scalar fields on our mesh and call this fh, which is f applied to mesh. And then fx0h is fx0 applied to mesh. And then fx1h is fx1 applied to mesh. And finally, fx2h is fx2 applied to mesh. Let's shift enter that. Okay, now before we do the spectral derivative, I want to visualize the fields. For this, I will copy in a function that produces a row of volume renderers. Let me just quickly go over it. So basically, it is a function that takes an arbitrary number of fields and then creates a row of subplots within Plotly. And for each of the entries or for each of the axes within this figure window, it will add a volume renderer for this three-dimensional fields, which we clip between minus one and one. And then it also adds a nice um, color bar. Okay, let's use this new function to plot the original function next to its three derivatives. So let's create a figure object and say plot isosurface row on fh, fx0h, fx1h, and fx2h. And then we just use figure to present it. Usually this runs quite quickly, but then it takes a couple of seconds before the plot appears. Okay, here we go. Finally, the plot appeared. And you see the three isosurface volume renders that first represent the original function and then the partial derivative with respect to x1, x2, and x3. And it can be quite cluttering. Let's first focus on the left plot and zoom out a bit. So we see that on this axis, we have x. On this axis, we have y. And then on the vertical axis we have set, unfortunately, the label clipped a bit. Let's first see that we get the correct values. So maybe I want to first rotate such that we have uh, the set axis pointing inward into the screen. And now we have to be careful that x now goes here from 0 to 1. We have to rotate it like this. So now x goes from 0 to 1 left to right, and y goes from 0 to 1, bottom to up. And here we see that the green value is associated with positive and the reddish value, purple value, is with negative. So we essentially, if you pick out a line here and go from left to right, we see the first sign mode, which is positive in the beginning and then has a zero pass through and then ultimately gets purple so negative. Whereas for the y, when we go from pick out a line close to the left edge and then go from bottom up, we see we have first green, then red, then green, then red again. So we basically have um, two periods. So the second sign mode. And now I have to be careful that Yes, we now look at it like this. This is a bit confusing. But if you take the edge, which is the closest to the screen, so which goes up vertically here, and then take a look at the colors in here, you see that we start with a green value, but it is already one right at the border of the domain. So that represents a cosine. And then we have this um, oval shape uh, in here, very hard to identify. I hope it's also nicely visible on YouTube. But but at least uh, that plop here, that represents uh, the part where the cosine is negative, And then we have it positive again. And we only have one period. So it's the first cosine mode. And then in the other plots, we basically see the partial derivatives. I invite you to download the notebook and play around with the plots yourself. But let's just have a quick look at it. So again, let me 
go to the top and have it like this. And here we basically see that if, I mean, it of course takes a lot of imagination and precise looking, but if you um, now take one line very close to the bottom and go from left to right, you see that in x direction, we now start at a positive value. Actually, it's greater than one because we next to just changing from sine to cosine, we also get an additional scaling factor. But importantly, we start at a positive value and then we get into a negative regime and then we are positive again. And that shows that the derivative of the first sine mode is actually the first cosine mode uh, just scaled. Um, when we take the derivative with respect to x1, we only change the shape in x1 direction, whereas in y direction, for instance, we still have the sine modes and in z direction, we have the cosine mode. And you see something similar with the other two partial derivatives. So at least I think now, of course, it's a bit hard to see, but I hope you trust me that we have the correct partial derivatives here. Let's now go to the actual part of taking the spectral derivatives. And since we will operate with the real valued Fourier transformation, we know, if you recall from the 2D RFFT video, that the wave number shape is not identical to the mesh shape in state space because actually over one axis, typically the last axis, we apply the RFFT that approximately halves the number of relevant modes because a real signal has a symmetric spectrum. Of course, it cannot do that on other axes. So whenever we do an RFFTN, there is one axis where we actually half and this, of course, has to be respected when we create the wave number mesh. So essentially, we have two wave number meshes in 1D. So we have wave numbers 1D real, for which we use np.fft.rfft frequency with n and 1 divided by n. And then, of course, we have to correctly scale it with 2 times numpy.pi divided by l. And then, of course, we have the wave numbers 1D full, which is numpy.fft.fft frequency. So mind the difference with the R, also with N and 1 divided by N, and then multiply with 2 times numpy.pi divided by L. And then similar to the original mesh, we will use a mesh crit operation. So we say wave numbers is numpy.stack on numpy.mesh crit wave numbers 1D full, wave numbers 1D full, and wave numbers 1D real. And here we will also use the indexing from creating the mesh. And that's very crucial that you use the same indexing here as well. And again, mesh crit returns, if given free 1D arrays, returns free 3D arrays, and then they are stacked together into one long four axis array with three dimensions in the zero of axis. So we can also take a look at it by saying wave numbers dot shape. So essentially here we have the free for the free coordinates that we also have in Fourier space and then 40 wave numbers in X direction, 40 wave numbers in Y direction and 21 wave numbers in Z direction. And here we moved the axis, which is approximately half is going to be the Z axis. Of course, if you have a domain or a problem where there's one axis or dimension for which you use more or significantly more degrees of freedom than the other ones, it can be reasonable to shift that. Of course, you can also create a wave number mesh where the 21 is here. And then later on with the routines of the FFT, you can make it operate or take the real FFT over that particular axis. With the wave numbers down, we can then create the derivative operator or the gradient operator with 1j multiplied with the wave numbers. And then ultimately, we can take the spectral derivative, so the partial derivative of f with respect to x0 spectrally is numpy.fft.irfftn inverse real valued Fourier transformation on n dimensions applied to the derivative operator indexed at 0 to get the derivative with respect to x0. And then this is multiplied with numpy.fft dot r f f t n for the real valued free transformations in n dimensions applied to 
fh. And then let's hover over the rffdn function and then read this important sentence. So it says this function computes the n-dimensional DFT over any number of axes in an m-dimensional real array by means of the FFT. And then importantly, by default, all axes are transformed with the real transform performed over the last axis while the remaining transforms are complex. As it says, it will by default transform the entire array, which is fine because we have this scalar field. So there's no additional channel dimension that we would not be interested in applying the FFT on. You can, of course, modify that by going to the axes command and then change uh, the actual labels or the, the axis indices um, over which you want to perform the FFT. So this is your option to adapt. Then we perform the multiplication with the derivative operator. And since we don't want to take the gradient, so all partial derivatives, but only the zero of partial derivative, we also do not get a channel dimension. So technically it is also fine to just do the inverse Fourier transformation and by default also applying it over all axes. But if you recall from the real IUT Fourier transformation video is that due to the way that we have the number of modes in one axis, there is actually an ambiguity how many degrees of freedom those are associated with. So it is always needed to inform the actual state space shape when using the real Fourier transformation. And we can do this by supplying S for shape and then giving N, N, N. And handily, if we now provide only three entries here, by default, the Fourier transformation or the inverse Fourier transformation would only be applied over the last three axes. So hypothetically, if we wanted to do the gradient, which does add a channel dimension, this would also correctly work then. Okay, let's shift enter that. Then we can compare the spectral derivative with the analytical derivative. So we'll do plot ISO surface row on fx0h for the analytical derivative and fx0h spectrally for the spectral derivative. Again, it runs quickly, but then it takes a little bit to have the plot pop up. And here we go. And as you might know, it's very hard to truly see that, but those two fields, the derivative fields, look quite similarly. So qualitatively, they seem to match. Let's also compute a numeric estimate by means of a relative error by doing numpy.linalg.norm of fx0h spectrally minus fx0h divided by numpy.linalg.norm on fx0h. And then we get an estimate which is in the range of 10 to the minus 15, so it's a very low number. And since we are working in double precision floating points, which has a machine precision at around 10 to the minus 16, that's a very low error. And this is also an error we would expect because we are operating on a band limited function. So we only have as many modes in our original field as we can also capture truly on our field. And we know that spectral derivatives with the FFT are exact for band limited functions. This channel is supported by Pasteur Labs and the Institute for Simulation Intelligence. Click the link in the video description to find out more how they merge machine learning and simulation in order to reimagine the scientific method. Also a big thanks to all my Patreons. If you also want to support my vision of free education on advanced mathematical topics, you find the link to the Patreon page down in the video description. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, then please leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. There is more awesome content on fast Fourier transformation and spectral methods that I'm pretty sure you're interested to see. Here you'll now see similar videos and I hope to see you in one of the next videos.